Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Brown will be moderating tonight, but while he's collecting money, I'll just simply uh, take over and uh, what we do. The college format for all of those, for all of you people who are new, is as follows. The first one is we have a brief announcement period, followed by the presentation of our speaker, followed by a question and answer period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period. The college consists of two rules, and I bet you we can name them. The first one is no smoke. One, one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Now we'll turn the meeting over to Brown so we can get started. Okay. All right. How about it? Our author and frequent. Uh, Commentator here at uh, the College of Complexes, Margaret Goldstein. Okay, uh, and I'm going to repeat this. <laughs> okay, when are things done poorly because of a bad attitude, and when are they done poorly because people don't know any better? In the past, my two books, this is one of them, Making Decisions That Don't Harm Others, <laughs> and The Selfishness System. Um, and my thinking, have stressed a bad attitude as being the real problem. But now I'm wondering if that's the whole story. I'm beginning to realize many people lack abstract thinking ability. To me, this means they have difficulty thinking about what they haven't experienced or what doesn't impact them directly and immediately. Abstract statements such as we need better infrastructure may go over people's heads. But if we said Irving Park Road needs to be fixed, that is well understood. Now for some examples of how this plays out in the real world. Take people's personal lives. Take seatbelt use. Seat belts reduce fatalities for front seat occupants 45% and injuries 50%. They were rarely used until required by law. And since then, there is 90% compliance in states where the police enforce the law. Otherwise, 78%. Not having actually experienced the possible consequences of not buckling up, people ignored seatbelts. As it happened to, you can't visualize it, apparently. Another example is our obese population. Food is taken in without a thought as to what it's like to have a heart attack, diabetes, or cancer. Then there's the fact that a majority of people reach retirement age, re or actually retirement, I mean, without sufficient savings, with 75% in 2010 retiring on less than $70,000 in their bank accounts. Let's move on to the provision of government Thank services. You. These cost Illinois and federal taxpayers billions. Yet they often fail to adequately address the problems they are supposed to solve. Um, take the CTA. It has taken years for bus drivers to figure out that pulling up to the curb allows short and disabled people to get on and off the bus without having to lower the step. And a few drivers still um, so does this, or does this go up? I don't know. I need to light down here.
Okay, I think so. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, bus shelters contracted for by the CTA have large openings letting the cold air in, which I say is defeating their purpose. They're supposed to protect you from the cold. The seats are narrow, even though 65% of Americans are overweight. Until 2012, I never experienced a driver announcing an imminent detour, meaning if a passenger's stop was in that detour section, they were out of luck. Have no advance warning. Uh, however, recently, in 2012, Devon Avenue was under construction for a long period and there were automated detour announcements on the Devon Avenue bus. These, of course, remained many, many um, weeks after the construction stopped, you know, typical of how the CTA functions. Schools are so noted for fail, falling down in the job that the point hardly needs stressing. However, I would like to illustrate the point with our experience with our two handicapped children in the Chicago Public Schools Special Education Program. There, even though federal legislation called the Education of Handicapped Children Act requires so-called individualized education programs, this is a formal, uh, it's a form that's actually supposed to be filled out, be drawn up for each student on the basis of his or her own needs, this is done only on paper and not actually carried out. Special education teachers seemed to lack the abstract thinking ability to put themselves in the place of a handicapped student in order to understand his or her needs. Our son, who has cerebral palsy in his right hand, was expected to learn to write on paper flying all over because he couldn't anchor it. That is, he was writing with his left hand and he couldn't have the use of his right hand to hold the paper down. He needed to learn the daily living skill, and I need to explain that this is a big part of training handicapped people. You do need, even if you don't read or write, you need daily living skills. So he was a teenager and it was time for him to shave, but he was unable to do it. Uh, my request to the occupational therapist at the school to, to train him with this was refused. And rather than that, she had him working on some contraption that didn't seem to be related to anything in the real world. Uh, my request to work with me on bus riding with him, and he did live near the school, it would have worked well, was refused. Our daughter's teachers tried to teach her writing by following dotted lines on paper. Even though books on the subject suggested gross motor mastery, that is blackboard, uh, before fine motor and use of a tactile approach. Uh, I don't want to go on too much on this subject, but uh, I will say that with the use of books, I did find a way to teach my children to read and write. Um, information that should have been available to the teachers. And our daughter was able to uh, learn with um, putting um, shaving cream on aluminum foil and she could start writing it in with her finger. And it was that tactile approach and it did teach her to write. Um, and then, then our son, we, we got uh, a book that didn't move around, a notebook. No, not just a piece of paper, but a notebook. And there's even was a, there was a weight of the ones too that we used. So he was able to write. Uh, our children were served in small classes of five or six students with a teacher and an aide a costly proposition indeed. This is what I'm saying, where money is like taxpayer money going down the rat, rat hole. It's not doing what it's supposed to be. These government services are not very often, a lot of situations, not doing what they're supposed to be. Um, there are other examples of poor judgment due to the inability to think about what hasn't been experienced. 
Often we, are, we have to fill out forms, but there's not enough space given for the information we're supposed to put in. Homes and even schools are constructed lacking handrails for steps. Dominic's and Payless shoe stores have merchandise placed so high that it can't be seen, much less reached by short people and wheelchair users. The federal government has poorly thought out policies such as those that contribute to the fact that 65% of Americans are overweight and an economy producing the same amount in 2011 as in 2008 but with 7 million fewer workers. Here are a few notes. To expand on these points, um, the um, federal government has dozens, a dozen or so food programs. They push food on the American public like nothing you can imagine. They, school, I don't know if people are, are familiar with school lunch programs, but these are pushed by the federal government. Anybody that wants to get out of them or modify them, or even require that every student be eligible in income um, terms is pushed away. You can't do that. The uh, Department of Agriculture is pushing this. Of course, what's got to be behind it? Getting more business for farmers, I suppose. But it's, it's very wrong, and it's, uh, the, um, <clears throat> and I was going to say that anyway, uh, there, it doesn't, oh yes, there was an attempt to get, many people, including Mayor Bloomberg, have attempted to make it so food stamps can't be reduced, can't be used for pop or junk food, or you know, like candy and, and such. Can't be done, refused, turned down, all right. The food companies are right there at the, F, at the um, uh, agriculture department lobbying against it. Now who is this country run for? Now, as far as the unemployment business, 25% um, of uh, men who are, have just graduated from high school, haven't gone any further, ages 25 to 54 are unemployed. That was the unemployment rate during the Depression when it was considered terrible. 43% um, of women were employed in 1970, and now 60% are with a big increase in the 1980s. Now why is that, why do we have these crazy things happening? Because the federal government um, has um, been pushing uh, technology. First of all, they invented, I guess everybody knows, the Pentagon invented the computer. They invented um, the, the internet. Since then, the government has been pushing it on everybody and everybody, and we've been told everybody should have a computer. And in the course of this, they've also not only have they been pushing technology, but they have tax breaks allowing companies to mechanize yeah. and have robots and this and that, uh, and they, you know, to encourage them. And then they have the nerve to say, Obama has the nerve to say, oh, these poor unemployed people, they're causing the unemployment. They're having robots coming out that will take over warehouses, they'll do every task in a warehouse. I think it's a frightening thing. I'm, I feel sorry for young people. I mean, it's, it's just awful. And what's happened as a result is what? They encouraged all these women with family leave and so forth, even women of newborn children to go into work. Meantime, they have these young guys who can't nowadays, who can't get jobs and therefore are not marrying. Therefore, you have kids being born without fathers. I mean, what, what is this government doing to us? I, I don't get it. Anyway, uh, to get back to um, there's more material here. I realize the fact that people simply can't understand what they haven't experienced is not their fault. What's morally wrong, though, and prevents things from improving is that when people come along with the necessary abstract thinking ability to get things done better, they are often excluded from participation. 
This happened to me when the Chicago Public Schools tried to force our kids out of their system and into inadequate, unsupervised private schools for handicapped children because I pushed for more effective ways to reach my children. Match the nerve of me, you know. Um, and, and one of the things was a home to school notebook. Again, in the books, in the literature about teaching handicapped people, a home to school, if you have a handicapped person who has a communication problem, well, you have a home to school notebook helping the teacher know what happens at home and the home and so forth, and you can elicit the communication skill from the child knowing what he's supposed to be talking about. It's a good system. It's, unfortunately, they never used it, never had it used for our kids anywhere. Uh, what we need is to encourage, not discourage, participation by people capable of abstract thinking. Such people should be put in charge of efforts, or at least listened to. The Congressional Budget Office, often referred to just as a CBO, has all kinds of expertise and data which they provide Congress and is routinely ignored by Congress when it draws up budgets and passes legislation. And yes, I think things are done poorly more because of moral lack than limited thinking ability, but the latter issue is part of the equation and must be taken into consideration. This is the end of my presentation. I have two copies, extra copies of this for anyone that would like to have them. And, um, and this is, uh, this is the end. <laughs> Margaret, Margaret, I know your your Brahms ready to take questions. My first thing is, you contend that there's not enough things being done today because of abstract thinking, or that people don't have the ability to get things done. Let me ask you then, what do you think about the phenomenon of Google, the phenomenon of Microsoft, um, some of the other technology companies that are doing very incredible things to help people's lives get better? such as some of the innovative techniques that the Bill Gates Foundation is using in the uh, charitable aid? And can you comment that it might not be a problem with abstract thinking, but maybe perhaps policy and government itself? Is this your bag? Uh, I realize that the technology revolution has done some good. Uh, but for one thing, it's only certain people. We've even had speakers here who say there are very few people that are even good programmers. So it probably is over the head of a lot of people. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, I won't acknowledge that it's a total waste. Uh, but and, and again, it's a certain type of uh, ability. I mean, we're not talking, and the person who should that we need capable of teaching special ed isn't it doesn't have the same skill base that someone that would do tech, highly technical work. I mean it's a different thing. Um, and and the let me see the latter was the last part of your question. How, is it more a matter of perhaps maybe government policy than wrong thinking or lack of cognitive skills? Well I think it's both and that's my conclusion but um, the um, What's I going to say? Um, the government, it, it, it's a tricky thing with the government, for example. You really don't know if it's a bad, mostly a bad attitude. It probably is. But I mean, the fact is, the expertise is there. They don't have an excuse to be so uninformed. And it isn't just the CBO, it's all of these, it's, oh, look, I can't think of the Melody Library of Congress, or all these agencies that do nothing but research and developing data. So, I mean, I, I did say in my conclusion that I do think the worst problem is the selfishness, you know, the self-serving, but this other impinges on, in other words, you don't want to jump to a conclusion, well, this person is doing this because they're bad when they really don't know how. I mean, I think it's important to understand that. And just, just as a corollary, do you, dis, do you think that decisions on government should be more based on data or based on gut feel? 
Uh, what was the last part? Data or what? The feeling that you get in the gut that might seem what's right. Uh, data. I'm sure that that's the only way the decisions are made in Congress. They certainly are not rational or logical or facts-based or anything. Forget the facts. Congratulations. You just found, you just, you had the same philosophy as a Google founder, Larry Page. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Margaret, what do you think is the role of money or profit in what you're talking about? Well, because what is money is the source of all evil? Um, the problem, I'll tell you this. Capitalism as such is the best system as far as bringing a good standard of living. But it must be regulated. The problem is, I still think the worst problem is our political system because it, um, it, it the money, um, and how will I say this? Uh, thanks. Money or, the politicians, the money is used, I mean, that the politicians let money influence them. That's what's wrong. We should have a system, we should have public funding of campaigns, for example. And we, we shouldn't let, you know, people, campaigns be um, paid for by rich people who just, you know, and, and special interest groups, the NRA, it's not just rich people, the NRA and all the special interest groups. Um, so, so it's not that money is a source of all evil, I think. I think it's that their government is, and it isn't just in this country. It's terrible all over. That you have to have a government that's accountable and answerable and is serving the whole country and not any special interest group, just because a special interest group pays them. You can get control. We didn't have to have, we know for a fact we didn't have to have the financial crisis in 2008. It's a known fact. They deliberately, especially under Bush, but also some of what the Democrats did, said we are not going to regulate those banks. They can do anything they want. So, thank you. Hope that answers. Yes. Margaret, thank you for a very impressive speech. I have a question. Thank you on your um, initial thoughts here, limited thinking ability and moral issues. Are there other possibilities? It, um, is it one or the other? Is it, could there be a possibility here? A possibility here? In other words, if we say, is, is it red or orange? I is can't it, really hear you too well. Okay. That's back. Okay. Uh, to, to repeat. Yeah, okay. Um, we're talking about limited thinking ability and moral lack. Mm -hmm. And these, I'm wondering if, if all of the possibilities have been explored. In other words, if someone would say, is, is it red or blue, uh, someone, someone might say, well, such as me. Uh, have you have you considered other possibilities, such as green, yellow, purple, and others? What's the question again? Is there some other explanation you mean besides selfishness and, and uh, limited thinking ability? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Has, has, is this an either or question, either regarding thinking or moral lack? Is, it should, should, should we... Um, consider the, the advice of, of the um, great semanticist uh, S.I. Hayakawa in saying that things should not necessarily be too, too as a number, valued. They sh we should consider more... Uh, Excuse uh, me, sir? Uh, no, because I, I think, especially in my... Sorry. Well, maybe I can't do that. Um, 
anyway, in my books, I, I do consider that it's a fact that, uh, I mean, I still think the basic problem is that keeps the world from not going around is selfishness, self-serving. I mean, people are simply uh, focused on themselves. And, and I don't think there's any two ways about it. And I don't think, you know, until you get rid of people focusing on themselves to the exclusion of everything else, you will ever solve anything. And that's exactly what's happening in Congress and happening with the presidency and all of these, uh, uh, you know, situations. Or the NRA or the whoever. I mean, the NRA member or the, it thinks, I am the biggest thing there is. There's nothing bigger than me. Small children don't matter. Nobody else matters. I mean, that's the selfishness outlook. And that's what's causing all our problems, the national debt. I mean, this is because Obama and all these people, they want to serve every little special interest group. Take some money here, take some there. And rather than considering that we have a $16 trillion national debt, and it has to be dealt with. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, men and women as far as uh, women needs to stay home and uh, not be on the way of young men in jobs. Um, do you think that traditional uh, attaching to traditional mental paradigms such as this one is going to be a hindrance in terms of creative and new problem solving. Um, good thinking, good rational living. Don't you think that we need to challenge those traditional values? Like no, the gender role. No, 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 I'll tell you why. Um, as a matter of fact, there are a few countries where, um, there are countries like the U.S. where it's, it's people still skeptical about mothers of preschool children working. But there are countries like Germany and the Netherlands that strongly believe this. Uh, there are, from, well I know you're probably, I think you're a psychologist, so probably I shouldn't quote psychology, but what I understand they've said is that bonding is a necess necessity for preschool children. They should bond with some, I mean, to me it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, you know, I mean, but that there is a steady figure there. Because stay at home dad, fine, that's fine. Um, but it should be, they have to bond to a certain the, the, the business of being in daycare, for example, and seeing different people all the time coming and going is well, not gender, helping. I asked about the gender. Gender then is not the issue. It's parenting, not gender. All right, you're right, you're right, yeah. Oh. Yes, I, I have a question myself, but I will refer to Joe. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, we see opposition uh, to uh, and, and ignorance of uh, the human benefits of unions, socialism, uh, universal health care. Is that a moral uh, problem or is that... You, I'm sorry, would you, I didn't quite get that. Would you repeat that again, please? No. No? Oh. <laughs> it's something about unions. I didn't quite get it. It's not coming up your it heart. Is, no, no, stay there. All right. I'll shout. All right. Opposition to unions, uh, to uh, socialism, to universal health care. Is that a moral failing or is that just poorly understood? That's uh, because of people that are able to think. Now, except for universal uh, health care, that's, uh, that's a given that that just is common sense. Unions and, um, I'm sorry, what was the other one? Unions and... Uh, Socialists. Social, social. Unions and socialists are very, very questionable. We can have a whole another meeting about that. Uh, unions have been... Oh, getting back to Chicago public schools. Public education in this country has been destroyed by the teachers' unions. That's yeah. enough of an argument, yes. I guess. I mean, there's no question about it. And uh, in fact, this thing about the charter schools, which they're so against, the charter schools do succeed with inner city poor kids that don't, no one else succeeds with. This is a known fact. And just throw out all charter schools, and they don't want the charter school, and they, and you should see, oh, I mean, I could go on and on about this. The way the darned, um, well, this is nothing to do with unions. I'm just going to say the, the CPS uh, administrator. I mean, it's a horror story. I mean, that whole thing, the whole public schools, the whole, um, 
thing of union, but they should never have been unionized. Unionized unions were more for like the the blue blue collar when seniority yeah. would make sense and so forth. Yeah, right. But you can't have seniority in schools. You can't have like you're cutting down in your staff, and so you're laying off the. Um, um, math teacher, let's say, who doesn't have the seniority, so then you have to get an English teacher to teach math. This happens. It's not right. And socialism, forget it. Socialism is not does not work. What you need is controlled capitalism. Capitalism that's truly regulated and not taken captive by, as it is, of course, by the special interest groups, which are the, you know, the, the uh, corporations and that. They should not be taken captive by them. The, should, the government should be in control, not the corporations. Uh, you're, you're advocating that children should be teachers. <laughs> <laughs> the, Probably. The seniority is not, uh, uh, not No, you know. At any rate, uh, Follow up, Margaret, to your school response. Uh, Having been in education, I do have bias as a teacher and as a CPS teacher, and I think maybe you had a personal experience with your child that's coloring the issue that it's unionization causing the problem when maybe you, you had a staff or some special ed teachers that didn't handle your child properly, but don't blame it on the union. And union sets the parity wage for that charter without union conventional schools, we wouldn't have a baseline for the charters, and it would be a kind of race to the bottom wage-wise in this city. We would be back to a lot of single people who don't need a very strong wage, many women, to what happened 50 years ago, running the schools for five or ten years, then jumping out of the system. Uh, the unions built a kind of backbone to the situation and professionalized it, I believe. Yes, but I mean, I, that's why I happen to know that you're right. My my brother-in-law was a teacher as a young man, and he's you know practically started in that. But the point is not by means of unions. You should have had just been a reform, and somebody should have gotten you know again if you had proper citizen involvement to see that and people, good people lobbying, not you know selfish people, but you know to see that teachers were adequately. Um, paid, but I have to differ with you. This does not have to do with my own, which was a bitter experience because I did, I've read extensively, and it's in my books about this this whole thing about unions and uh, education, and I've read it repeatedly. Nothing years after my kids were out of school, I've been reading this thing that it is indeed the. Uh, unions that are considered to have really ruined uh, public education in this country, and I, I have read that in, in good, you know, um, uh, solid publications. So I would differ on that. Well, uh, that's fine. from the inside, but did your son ever learn to shave that? Yeah. You know, you know what? We even went to it. Speaking of, you know, let me tell you another story. Uh, not necessarily rural policy. When I said there are agencies that don't do anything, I asked them to help. Wouldn't do it. Oh. You know what? It was just. <laughs> He's, he's 42 now, and, and, and I'm going to say maybe at some point in his 30s, he finally just caught on to it himself. I mean, he's, no one would help him. People, experts in CP? No. Never got any help from anybody. That's my calling. Uh, I'm glad I heard you lecture. You, you have good observations about things that have screwed up. I'm the guy who says government exists to destroy people's lives. <laughs> We're on the same page. I mean that. Yeah. Has it occurred to you that things are not screwed up because people don't care or because people are incompetent? Has it occurred to you that things are screwed up because very powerful people in high level positions of government or of industry are purposely jerking us around just for the sake of jerking us around to keep us stupid, to keep us docile? Well, sometimes you have to wonder. I mean, because when you see what Bush did, and now when you see what Obama is doing, and you think, yeah, are these men deliberately screwing up? Yes, I mean, they are. Yeah. That's my point. Has it occurred to you that they really are deliberately screwing up? Sometimes you wonder. Well, I don't think 
all politicians do, though. I mean, I think I really think I think the real problem is all just serving special interest groups. I mean, Obama has never found a special interest group he didn't want to serve. Now he's serving parents of four-year-olds. I'm I'm not going to take a shot at you. I'm really not. No. But I think you're being too kind and too generous to these people who really are screwing us and really are trying to destroy our country. I, you know, I've said the same thing. I've, I've said that to my husband. Have I said that? Yeah. It's, 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 we're getting into rebuttals. Questions, questions. Yep. Yeah. Margaret, well, what do you, do you have any proposal for helping us to uh, think better, to improve thinking in general? How are you going to uh, Very good make question. us yeah, think good better? Question. Other than not to uh, have us think about ourselves, we shouldn't think about yeah, only yeah, ourselves. I, I tell you what, what um, else can we do? A lot, of, a lot of it is a matter of, well, putting oneself in the place. The thing is, in this case of the special education teachers not knowing what to do with special ed kids, the information was there. I think it's a matter of seeking the information you need. I mean, for example, I was no good in math, so I had when I had a problem at work with math, well, okay, I went and found a source, something to help me. I mean, you don't just go on making mistakes and doing some wrong stuff. You have to find, um, you know, an answers. I, I think it's, it's, it's that, you know, to find out, okay, you're stumped. Or you hear somebody use a word like infrastructure. Instead of blazing, I'm not going to listen to that. Why don't you go look it up in the dictionary? You know, the person, why doesn't the person? Yeah, well, I still use dictionaries. And you, you know, um, people do not have to be as low level as they are. And you know there is such a thing as mental laziness. And the thing is, to inform themselves. The best way to pick up like knowledge, for example, is to like read a book, take notes on it, and then study your notes. It sounds like school, I know, but it, it's really, if, if you want to, people want to do better, they just have to work at it. Yeah, yeah Margaret, you don't like special interest groups. I'm probably involved, or at least a paper member, of 25 or 50 associations. Now, according to you, I should go in on Monday and quit all of these, whether or not they involve public transportation or rights of the child or women's rights or whatever, because special interest groups are no good and have ruined this nation. And I'd like to know if your group that you get out and recruit for is a special interest. I think, Charlie, that different. I think people know what I mean by a special no, interest group. Obviously, I'm mean. not against a group that's trying to improve the CTA. I just got through criticizing the CTA. Uh, and, I, you know, I mean, it's understood when the, the word is commonly used as, as derisively to, to say, you know, you're talking about the NRA, or the um, the um, National Manufacturers Association, or the co 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 uh, co uh, the what is it called? Uh, the co what are the democratic processes? Freedom of assembly to advocate what they want. If David wants his Libertarian Party, he's entitled to it. No, and he's got a special interest group. You, everybody, the if we believe in free speech, you can Even demonstrate. Right but the here. point is not to go and get so much power that you screw the whole system up by having a whole system just serve you. I mean, the NRA, I mean, what better example of a, um, a special interest group that's gone, you know, out of, gotten out of hand? This is out of hand. I mean, when a special interest group, they're not just advocating, but they're actually getting the power to change things and harm the rest of society. That's what I mean by a special interest group. Oh, well, yes, uh, Jane This is called a softball question. Uh, and what is a par partial answer to Dr. Lichtenberg's question? Couldn't you have answered that by people could read your two books? <laughs> 
Uh, well, <laughs> but you know, thank you. But you know what? I'm I'm afraid those two books stressed the selfishness angle, and that the lack of understanding angle. So uh, you know, I mean, I think it was a good question, Bob, and pro probably. Maybe you could find an answer. I don't know. It would be good to find an answer. Oh, well, part of it's the education system because our education system is lousy too. And they say kids get out of college now and they haven't learned anything and they hardly even understand what they read. And this whole, well, you, oh yeah, right, you know. <laughs> but it's better teaching. I mean, oh, yeah, this one. This is it. They're saying that people, the young people, are spending so much time on the internet jumping from subject to subject they've lost the ability to see through a whole thought and to concentrate. They're losing their real concentration ability. This I have read. I'm not going to swear on a stack of Bibles. I don't know. I read, But that's an example. If you didn't have these kids spending all the time on the internet and had them reading a book and seeing a whole thought through that's what makes your mind go, is the reading. Yes? The best way is to mold. Margaret, I have a question for you. You know, there's a lot, that, a lot of different approaches to education, and I know that the CPS does things, but what are your thoughts on the Montessori school, for example? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the, the information to really intelligently answer. I know it's considered good, but I don't really know why. I, I know it's, when my kids were kids, you know, I mean, other people, like other parents were kids, not handicapped kids, but they were sending their kids to get a good start, they said, with the Montessori. I'm sure it has offered something good, helpful. Yeah, you spoke out against the Family Need and Medical Act, and the young woman here just served me a cup of coffee as a single parent. If she needs to care for that child, do you think she should get fired? I don't think she should be a single parent. <laughs> well, how would you do her that? Okay, you guys do realize that it's harmful not to have a father. You've read the umpteen articles, if I've read one, I've read a hundred, about how harmful not having a father in the home is. It harms the child's emotional development. What if she's got a special ed child that wants to go What's that got to do with it? No, but that's even be, worse. If she's absent from work, she needs Let me to tell you, a special ed child, you need the two parents. Let me tell you that. It is a terrible, terrible well, risk to be going around life. having a child without a father. Yeah, what do you mean you can control the circumstances of life like this? Oh, are you, or someone's holding a gun at your head saying you have to have a kid? Are you kidding? They choose to have them. But of course, this is fed into by the federal government because fewer people are marrying because the educated people are marrying, but the lesser educated, they're not getting jobs, they're afraid to get, the guy's afraid to get married, he's afraid he can't, you know, support the family or be out of work and this and that. Wait a minute, wait a minute, let me rephrase this, start again. It is very, very common that I have represent women, employed women, who have that, but they are called because of child care, either a handicapped child or from school. They're absent for work. They will get in trouble and get fired. And they have husbands, but they're mothers. And the mother is the primary caregiver of the child. And she says, do I have to choose between my child and my job? I take care of the child. Says, choose a child. You just, just this law choose says a child. the mother doesn't have to make that choice. Right. Either the father or the mother should stay home. I mean, if you're talking about children who are, are not yet in school, they're absent from work. And but they, they got themselves into the situation. I mean, why did they get? Why did they have the child if they weren't going to be available? What was the point? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, Margaret. Yes. Um. This. This brings me to a, a, bit of quest, to a question that I was going to ask a few minutes ago, and that is, um, in your talk, you're saying a moral lack, but moral what, what? a moral lack. Yeah. Now, which morality um, um, 
where, what is the source of the morality? Um, is it political? Is it religious? Is it social? And, and um, please expound on that. Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, the, um, morality should just be based on the golden rule. I mean, never mind any religion or anything. It's like, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Or it's like, as I had, don't focus on yourself. Consider the whole community. Constrain your actions by the effect on other people that you're not on an island. There are people around you. That is morality. It's that simple. It's just a, a set of values. Well, I was going to ask you what uh, the consequences are of Louder, Brown. electing uh, Louder, Brown. Louder. Speak into the mic. I, I wonder what the consequences are of electing uh, legislators or executives uh, who have to appeal to a wide range of concerns in, in uh, uh, a society and uh, are then expected uh, to administrate or manage uh, particular concerns which require special knowledge. I'm saying that our legislators and uh, elected executives are uh, experts at getting elected uh, and appealing uh, to a wide range of concerns uh, in society. Uh, but uh, not a specialist in, in particular concerns, and yet they are uh, uh, either administrating or legislating on those particular concerns. Yeah. How do you deal with the fact that they don't have the expertise? Is that what you yeah. mean? Yeah. Well, okay, I gave the example, at least in Congress. I don't know about um, executives in the business world, but in Congress, you have the CBO, the, um, I can't even think of all the names, all the different agencies that they, CBO gives regular reports to Congress. Any congressman can go and ask. Mm -hmm. Ask, you know, like say the cost of something they want to, uh, educating all four-year-olds. What would that cost the taxpayers? You can go to the CBO and find out that is, if it's affordable, if it's, I, I don't agree with it, but anyway, but if it's a, you see what I'm saying with them, I mean, I'm sure that big corporations must also have some source of expertise. I mean, they must hire people that are specialists and that, but what they have. Are you still? Why are you? I only have. Yeah, no, Doug, 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 nobody else. Doug, Doug is asking. She will <laughs> Hey, Margaret, uh, <laughs> you, get, you, get another <laughs> you rightly pointed out that uh, the writing's on the wall, and it looks like uh, as we proceed further, it's certainly into the next generation, uh, there won't be enough jobs to go around amongst uh, all the people that are coming along. And uh, so uh, how do you suggest that uh, we deal with that unless we uh, use some kind of socialism of the government to spread the uh, work around, reduce the work week, to job sharing and whatnot? I would suggest that the stupid federal government get out of the way. But it won't happen. Stop, stop, stop giving tax breaks to businesses right away to encourage them to put in new um, equipment. Stop that now. Stop developing. You know what they do? They rush into developing these new technologies and stuff without having any idea what the consequences are. Stop. Stop that. Don't come out with a new technology, whether it's a cell phone where people are driving using cell or whatever, until you know the possible effects of it. This country is, is technology mad. That's what I would say. But I definitely, that tax break, and we, we should all be writing our members of Congress to get rid of the tax exemptions, which they lose $1 trillion a year in revenue to, and to the, for these special interest groups, to do what they want, and they distort the economy. They're very bad. So, but get them out. Get the, um, the uh, you know, uh, the business tax breaks for no equipment ended. 
So your only answer is Luddite. Not Luddite, no. I mean, that's... I didn't say the technology, I answered Tim, you know, I mean, sir, it's certainly some technology, but look, let's stop for a while. Let's have a, a what's the word? Um, what's the word? Uh, what's, I can't think, we'll temporarily stop it. And analyze it. Analyze where we are. Analyze the job situation. Don't keep on, on and on, more and more, you make these silly, ridiculous things. You know, Mark, if you uh, listed four views, your powers of logic, and came up with the four issues, the premium, it's in your book too, the four stellar issues of public transit. And they don't match any, they don't appear on any of the 16 on my flyer. Now, if I don't have a bus, or I can't afford to get on one, or if one's not scheduled, or it stopped running, does it really matter to me what kind of bus shelter I am? Learn to drive. Well, you know, I mean, Isn't there a little higher priority? You're being facetious, but the point I'm trying no. to, make, to make is that people don't think through. That's just an example of not thinking of something. Well, these engineers, these people that set up these bus shelters probably never rode a bus, probably have no idea what it's like to ride a bus. They blow over in the wind and kill people. They, I've seen it on Michigan. Uh, it's to stop the wind and it rust. Uh, no, no. Do you uh, want a shelter? The, the point the of a bus shelter is to protect you from if the you cold. Are, yeah, but if it's unsafe. Well, what about taking to do with it? They blow over. Just because if they don't have holes in them, I don't, I don't yeah. believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe. It. I think if they know how to construct, that's not believable. Well, that's what the architects told me. I've seen one blow over. <laughs> then it wasn't built right. <laughs> All right, then it had, then it had the well, holes in it. it, it By it getting blew into on. it, are these really the priorities of public transit, the behavior of a bus driver? When I do, what if our buses stop running? There's a bus route here. Well, who's saying they should stop running? I'm talking about improvements. I'm not against public transportation. I don't believe in driving. I absolutely believe in public transportation. That's why I'm so conscious of it. All right, I just found it odd that your priorities don't appear on our list. <laughs> that our organization and maybe came you're up with. Okay, maybe they should. All right. How are you trying to signal me or just holding your head? All right. Uh, okay. Let's get into rebuttals. I think we are in time for rebuttals. So I All right. Know. Let's go. Well, yeah. Let's thank Margaret. All right. I'm not going to ask how many people have rebuttals today. Uh, I'm simply going to give time. Use the microphone. Five to seven minutes, probably. Uh, yeah, five to seven minutes sounds logical. In this case, uh, I might narrow it down if we get ready. But uh, you're, you're on and you've got up to <laughs> Joe Mayer. I wish to thank our speaker this evening for her uh, interesting um, analysis of the world situation and. Uh, the deficits that we face morally and intellectually. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think rather than a moral deficit, our speaker's ignorance of the uh, contradictions of, quote, controlled capitalism is, uh, is manifest and I think needs to be uh, thought out and analyzed by our speaker and those who associate with her ideas. Um, as far as unemployment is concerned, uh, with the robots taking over, everyone thinks that we have to do something uh, to create more jobs. No, all we have to do is reduce the work day and the work hour, the work week, uh, instead of with no reduction in pay, of course. All we have to do is cut the work day to, say, four hours a day, three days a week, and everyone will have a job, uh, approximately. 
except for Charlie, of course. <laughs> and uh, for my final remark, I want to draw your attention to the uh, uh, fact that the, the event that occurred uh, uh, this morning in Russia, where that very large bus-sized uh, asteroid uh, entered the atmosphere over Russia, created a very large uh, explosion, equal to, they say, about 20 uh, atomic bombs. Uh, moving through the atmosphere at anywhere between 33 and 44,000 miles per second per hour, uh, it created that. It's important to remember that because in 1908, there was another event over Russia called the Tunguska Explosion, where it leveled the forests in northern Siberia for very, very large, uh, in a very large area, hundreds of miles. And what is joining these two things is, in 1908, probably because of the Tunguska Explosion, the Cubs won the World Series. Now we have another event over Russia, very large explosion, so we can look forward to the Cubs winning the 2013. <laughs> Margaret, I'm glad that you brought the topic. I think the topic is, is of utmost importance. And uh, it was interesting the, that you mentioned also special education, because uh, education and special education are, are, are really uh, suffering. And uh, I'll start with that. I, it, it seems to me that the problem with education in this country is that there is too much an over-focus on compliance and uh, a discouragement of challenge. A challenge that can be creative, uh, yet challenge to what is and the traditional values. And uh, the way teachers are are trained quite often follows a recipe book. And as we know, recipes are, um, are bound to uh, cheat people on the sides of the curve. Um, now, as far as the, um, the reasons, I, I was thinking on the way, I was talking to with Martin about um, the title of, of your book and um, what what are the reasons that true we are the, it's it's a, our culture as a general is not thinking enough I don't think it's the ability um, human beings have this part in the brain that allows them to abstract better than some other mammals although it is questionable sometimes. Um, <laughs> Um, but it is um, uh, we have we have uh, different re reasons to uh, that um, prevent I think uh, people under some circumstances or cultures more than others from using this kind of thinking um, anxiety or angst. Some sociologists attributed it to the complexity of modern life, all the options and all the different sources of information that impinge on, on people and um, a kind of overload people with too much negative freedom which impairs their decision making. Um, powerlessness. Um, lack of sense of efficacy, which is the lack of, of feeling in a, in a large society like, like a democracy, like so-called democracy, that uh, the feeling that what you, what you do has any impact or will make any dent anywhere. Um, the other kind of culture that we have, which is over-competitive and under-cooperative, that puts us into a, a rival, into a binary. You talked about this binary way we look at, we, we process information rather than looking at nuance, David. Um, and that's, that's a, a big impairment in 
in uh, uh, being able to get a fair thinking or valid information. Um, and of course, propaganda, PR, I don't know, we didn't mention it yet, but um, this is information that slips right to the subconscious and has a lot of power on decisions that we make and what we think later on is very often a rationalization of those subconscious messages that we automatically assimilated. It's called brainwashing. Um, thinking in policy, when uh, under those circumstances also, people tend to think in terms of uh, general policies that they have, which means like, like a recipe book. They have one solution that fits a whole category of, of um, issues or stimuli, and um, instead of coming to every issue, every instance, on the basis of the case of, of the information right there, so that um, in this case we tend to make generalizations. Unfortunately, Margaret, I noticed that you made some, some really serious generalizations and um, that's a fallacy. It's impossible to, to um, for all people or all cultures or uh, all, all marriages to um, have the same basic one solution. Um, let me go just uh, to the marriage, uh, I mean this really disturbed me quite a bit. Um, what should or shouldn't has nothing to do with how we are going to solve the problem because should is not the real world, okay? Um, so in some instances for example, in some very bad marriages or relationship, divorce is way better for the kids than marriage. And a single parent can do much better than um, uh, two people. Uh, the happiness of people is another moral value that you are uh, discouraging. The, 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 the uh, father and the mother are still people. Um, Besides, there are other ways to, to uh, raise children than in a legal marriage. A lot of people live together and have a much better arrangement in life. Um, so what we need really to encourage good thinking is stay with the real world, um, avoid generalizations, look at nuance, and always defy and, and challenge traditional values such as genders, such as marriage, and so forth. Uh, by challenging them, we have a chance of coming to really higher level solutions. Uh, thanks, Margaret. Uh, it was a very interesting talk, very thought-provoking, and uh, I would recommend that people... Uh, I read Margaret's two books, and I would definitely recommend them. I would also recommend, which goes along with a lot of the stuff Margaret said, a, a book that was suggested by a, a speaker. I think his name was uh, Dr. Holland. Uh, uh, Why America Failed by Morris Berman. I, don't think I would also it. recommend uh, a DVD that again uh, hits on this topic. Money, Power, and Wall Street put out by PBS. I watched that twice. Uh, and it, it's got a lot of this stuff because one of Margaret's main ideas is what is really good for the whole country? I got that out of her uh, books and talking to her. Uh, I think that is a, a, a really important thing. And she asked the question, uh, what is this country for anyway? 
Well, I would say that right now it's for the rich and the corporations, uh, which isn't a good idea. And uh, talking about bright people, the corporations and the elite, they buy those bright people. They buy those PhDs, those uh, lawyers, and those CPAs, and those business uh, experts. They buy them, and guess what? They're bought. Not too many of them seem to say, hey, cram it, I don't need your money. Uh, that's part of the problem we got. As far as the answer to the uh, uh, selfishness uh, question, I would say a partial answer is community organizing. Uh, and community organizing starts with selfishness. Saul Alinsky, his two books, uh, Ed Chambers, uh, uh, Michael Geekin, these kind of people, you start with self-interest, but then you go to the big picture. And as far as thinking, uh, we have sort of collective thinking. When I go to a community organizing meeting, I have six or seven or eight people around the table. And incidentally, with Jane Adams Senior Caucus, if there are eight people around the table, four or five of them are women. That helps. So you get this collective idea. So you go from self-interest to the big picture, and you get the benefit of all these people's thoughts, and then you put the thoughts into action. That's a sliver of answering the question, what do you do with selfishness? How do you overcome selfishness? Selfishness. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have some things here I'd like to show you. I have here a bottle. A flashlight, a letter, a ruler, a cup. A couple of scoops and a night light. A spoon pair of sunglasses and a pair of safety glasses. Something else that fell that I don't even know what it was. That's all right. Anyway, what do all these things have in common? They're all plastic. A godsend to civilization. How many people here remember Linko bleach? And it came in a glass bottle. How many people do you suppose slipped and fell carrying a bottle home and cut themselves up real bad. That's a problem that was addressed with plastic bottles and that hasn't happened in a long, long time. Plastic is a wonderful, wonderful thing for civilization. What's more, the number of jobs that it has created our, they probably number in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions. So anyone who says that plastic is not good or takes a stand against plastic, I think ought to have their head examined. And what's more, the sanitary aspect of it. I showed you a plastic spoon in a plastic wrapper. It stays sanitary. And when you finish using it, you throw it away. And another great thing about plastic is that when it's no longer needed, when it's no longer needed, it can be melted down and made into other products. The same as metal, except that plastic doesn't rust. And so, once again, capitalism 
handles the crown if it's only allowed to. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Back to uh, Saturday Night Live for the homeless, which I may be next year when my lease expires. Uh, this gentleman just talked about plastics. The next time you want to talk about plastics, ask him about estrogens. Um, last week, I had the opportunity to treat a young lady that had been suffering for at least 15 years with chronic fatigue syndrome. No doctors could help her. They medicated her. They told her she was crazy. Uh, they sent her to psychiatrists. And for 15 years, I've been addressing chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, which is very, very simple. It's hypoxia, cellular deprivation of oxygen. It's what causes fatigue and fibromyalgia, which are identical syndromes. I treated her uh, a few days ago, and she's doing just fine. We've got the oxygen back in her. This is part of the reason I went to jail in uh, 2006 for trying to help these women's issues. Because they don't want women healthy, they don't want kids healthy, they don't want you healthy. There's 167 million Americans that wake up every day and gobble up all kinds of pharmaceuticals, including my dead mother, who was dead, uh, drugged the morning she died with Depakote and Synthroid. Stress reduces the immune system. So when you have a hypothyroid condition, it's usually because of stress. The adrenals lower the immune system. They found that out years ago in very, some very simple research. When they reduce stress on people, their thyroid popped right back up again, and they did not need Synthroid uh, and all these thyroid drugs. They also put on weight, because they're a steroid. They reduce calcium. I, re, I uh, uh, was introduced to a lady in Canada when I was up there on a, a fibromyalgia conference that was paralyzed with Synthroid. She was one of the best grade school teachers in Canada for many years and now was paralyzed with uh, osteoporosis. It, take, it sucks the calcium out of your body too. And it's one of the biggest drugs out there along with the other th uh, thyroid drugs. Well. On my radio show yesterday, I broadcast twice a week to 42 million listeners around the world. I internet stream at AmericanVoiceRadio.com. I've been doing it for about 10 years with a two-year uh, vacation when I was on probation after I got out of jail. Um, a doctor called in, and one of the questions I addressed her with was, when did you find out that there were 300 million Americans out there stupid uh, Americans that were addicted to something, whether it was sugar, cheeseburgers, french fries, coffee, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, okay, that need a drug to change their behavior and their lifestyles. And she didn't even take a breath. She said it was my first day in medical school. Yeah. My first day, they said, they're waiting for you, Doc. You get out there, you get to sit on your fat ass for the rest of your life and write prescriptions for these stupid people out there, okay, that are just waiting for your drivel, that you're going to get your black hat and your black glove and your black needle and your black bag and the black rose. Anybody that's familiar with the Italians know exactly what the black rose is. When you bite the black rose, you're the next one to get that 45 in the temple. You're dead. You're real dead. So that's what these doctors are about. It's all black. It's skull and bones. It's Dr. Mengele and all these other clowns that are out there just waiting to drug you up. The multi-trillion dollar business of the health care industry. And if you're a senior, which most of us are here, if I'm not mistaken, I just turned 68 a few weeks ago. 
Obama wants to get his claws on us. I'm not getting any insurance. I don't have any income. So what's he going to do? Attach my 1040? I'll tell you how to get rid of the 1040. You put on the front of it when you get your next copy. I have declared a vow of poverty. Leave me alone. Sign it, date it, and send it back to St. Louis. I did it five years ago. You hear the phone ringing? I don't. I'm at the bottom of the pile. That's where it belongs to. Yeah. There's no income tax out there. You cannot tax effort. You can tax profits. Your corporations can pay billions. But when's the last time, you know this answer, when's the last time Exxon paid any income tax? Good. Right. They never have. Exxon Mobil, Exxon Valdez, they have never paid any income tax. A multi-billion dollar corporation have never paid any income tax because they legally avoid income tax with their tax lawyers and their accountants that write everything off like free oil. All that oil from God is squeezed out of the coal into the earth. They're sucking it out of there at a penny of, uh, for 55 gallons, converting it to gasoline. And I saw a BP the other day, which should be giving us free gasoline for the next 200 years for what they did to the Gulf. Okay, 490 a gallon for Mr. Burke and his uh, uh, limo. Okay, so what's he doing the other day? See this in the paper? He's going to take out a, a um, content in hand soap. Yeah, he's going to be real philanthropic after robbing the city of Chicago for years. You know, Mr. Clean. So it's really exciting out there, okay? But the drugging that's going on, this is what I'm fighting, okay? I work with this every day. People that are on prescriptions for absolutely nothing. We just took a guy, a uh, 30-year-old black man, off of three HIV drugs. He wore himself out, and all HIV is is immune deficiency. Anyone here could be diagnosed with HIV. They just put it in that panel, and when you show maybe 60, 70, 80,000 HIV viral, okay, it can be from shingles. There's 26 syndromes that are identical to HIV. That's why they've never isolated the uh, virus. You want to see the movie uh, the band played on? It's a perfect explanation of how they devised this uh, AIDS and HIV to get rid of gays and blacks. Okay? Well, it didn't work. These people figured it out. They got a lot of money. They got into the inside. They got into the inner sanctum of what the government was doing. I figured out this AIDS thing was a big scam. Now the, uh, you got Bill Gates and his wife wandering around the world injecting little children in Africa with the AIDS virus. Okay? They come up with HIV, they give them AZT, Trisavir, all these AIDS drugs, and guess what? They're dying. They're dying now. And that's what their thing is about eliminating people. Okay? They want to eliminate, what is it, uh, 90% of the world's population, okay, and the blacks and gays are first to go, then they're coming after us, okay. I don't see a lot of blacks in this uh, audience. Time limit? Quite often. Oh, what a coincidence. Yeah, one. Oh, that's, yeah, he's ex-cop. Good guy, okay. He, he agrees with what everything I'm doing, okay. But we're... What is this, an exclusive club here? You know, is this like Ridgemore Country Club or Beverly Country Club? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, it sure does. Look, all the golf caps here. Here, now, what is that, Infinati or something? Or Internet or Sentate Senate? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, we're an exclusive club here. White people only need apply, I guess. Okay, pardon? One minute left? One, half a minute left. Okay, very good. Very good timer. We got a little extended stay here tonight. Nice seeing you again. Okay, I'm headed for Idaho. Got a lady over there had a bump on her chest when she got all stressed out with her divorce. They went on a fishing mission, took out six inches of her colon, and gave her a, a bag for her feces, and then gave her a hysterectomy. They still have the bump on her chest. Chemo, radiation. She refused uh, morphine, so they said, go home and die. 31 years old. 
I'm going out to Idaho to see if I can help her out. See you in a couple weeks. Margaret, as much as I appreciate your speech tonight, I'm going to have to disagree with you on one thing, and that is the teachers' union. You see, I look back at my mother, who was a public eighth grade English teacher for quite a few years, and she did do a lot of the things to help out special needs students over the years. At a lot of times, the not being in, a, in accords with the administration. But when, because she was outside the norm, there was a concentrated effort to let her go or get out of the uh, teaching profession because she was not constructing with the norms. I'm going to say this. Thank God for the union protection of her job. Yeah. On the other hand, my father was also a business owner. And he too had employee problems. And it took the threat of a Teamster organization before some fundamental reform was made in his business. Number one, going from a long 16-hour day to basically a first and second shift and hiring a few more people to handle the workload. I was about 16 at this time hearing some very interesting dinner conversations over these two extreme viewpoints from my parents. And to be honest with you, I came through with the simple conclusion that sometimes you need a union and sometimes you don't. It's all about the principle of countervailing power. Today, a lot of people blame our evil corporations for the badness of the world. But you have to realize an evil corporation needs to make money. And where did they get that money? From you, the people who buy things. They get it from you, the people that make the choices to get things going. Like it or not, what a capitalist system is, it's the most democratic system in the world. You get to pay for what you vote for by the dollars that you spend. And frankly, we've seen a lot of corporations fall because of you know lack of money or lack of spending or they're just no longer hip anymore so they go out of business and rightly so I think the process of bankruptcy is probably one of the best things that's happened to this country to let a business fold and and close down quickly also at the same time you need a sense of getting a new corporation up and running fast so that other jobs can be provided all I'm gonna say is this the world has generally benefited from globalization and capitalism than not. If you look at the world 300 years ago, you had your still, your lords of the manor in a basic agrarian agricultural economy. We were about as well off as some of the central, central economies of Africa, with your rich people being the lords of the manor. Yes, maybe we still have a few lords of the manor hanging out in Wall Street or New York City at this point. But I can definitely say that the common man is a lot better off because of the revolution in goods, services, and other things that a modern economy provides. And as far as technology is concerned, you know, Margaret, what you may not realize is that the very studies that you look, that you're citing from the Congressional Budget Office, tonight when I go home, all I have to do is go to the Congressional Budget Office website pull up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of research topics and I can do this at 1230 at night on a Saturday and not have to go to a public library to look at it. I can download this stuff. I can print it at a reasonable cost and that is what to me is the fundamental difference between even now and maybe 20 years ago. You can research a good talk in less than half a day, what would normally take you two to three weeks to find the right source material in a library. And yes, today, public libraries are more better than ever. You walk in there and you don't know what you're doing. A li a today, a modern librarian usually has a master's level in information science. 
and they help you guide you and they will help you find what you're looking for in a lot of cases because let's face it navigating the internet can sometimes be a, a tough thing even though we have a lot of search engines and things like this there are still some obscure topics and other things or places to see that you need a little help with the human intervention as far as uh, Facebook and the social networking what's happening in computers today is what people have been doing for years they sit down they talk to one another they get together they do it more virtually now than they did when they were back in the uh, back even 30 years ago when I remember we had a we couldn't get a phone call into our house because my sister was always using our landline when the cell phone came out that landline's freed up now mom can get a call from her father or dad can call home and get working properly for me you know the one thing that's really helped me out is the revolution that we've seen in online video you know we can now broadcast our reef our college on the internet for the whole world to see and if you looked at it I've gotten some very interesting comments mostly how these guys can still believe in communism is beyond me some of the so we've also had other people say other things but it's quite a, quite an interesting world we're living in all I'm gonna say is what I said last week what are the two most remarkable inventions in the last 200 years number one was the revenue bond and number two was the invention of the modern corporation thank you very much <laughs> I'm Michael Goldie. I'd like to thank Margaret for coming here and giving her presentation. I'm glad I heard it. She made many, many valid points. I'm going to say it again, Margaret. I'm not taking a shot at you, but I think you're way, way too generous and kind to the people who run this country. I think the vast majority of all elected officials in this country are despicable creatures. And the people who are behind them, who are telling them what to do, are even more despicable. Elected officials don't even decide whether or not they should run for public office until they start taking bribe money and seeing how good the bribe money comes rolling in. They form an exploratory committee to help them decide if they want to run for office to see if there's public support to support their candidacy. And what that means is as soon as they form an exploratory committee, they can start collecting campaign contributions, which are nothing but bribes. And if that bribe money comes rolling in, if the guy collects three or four hundred thousand dollars in bribe money in the first week or so, he figures, man, this is a good scam. So he decides to run for public office. Why not? It's the quickest way to become a millionaire in this country. I believe that there are two very large groups of people in this country who are actively, purposely, knowingly doing everything they can to destroy the United States of America. They're trying to destroy our society, our culture, our way of life, our economy. Essentially, they have already destroyed our economy. But there are two very large groups of people who are doing this, and they're doing it knowingly. They're doing it on purpose. There's a very large ruling class in this country that's making billions and trillions of dollars from this country. They want to destroy human life in this country. Not actually kill us, but they want to destroy our way of life. They want a bunch of docile lackeys to work for them, to make them more money. They want people who are docile, people who keep their mouth shut, people who won't complain, people who do what they're told, people who bring in money for them. The other large group of people is a large worldwide organization made up of people from all countries, from all backgrounds, all ethnic, religious, national backgrounds. They're doing everything they can to destroy the United States of America, and they're being very successful. They want to do this because they believe that by destroying the United States of America, that will end the American empire that exists throughout the world. And they're probably correct. There's one more thing I want to mention, and that's this thing about the Pope. 
we were told that the Pope is going to resign from office. Needless to say, I don't know what's going on. I have no sources of information. All I know is what's in the mainstream media. But I believe this is an incredibly momentous event. Not just because it's been six or eight hundred years since it happened last, but it might take many, many years before we even start to get a hint as to what's going on behind the scenes. I cannot imagine anybody saying, I quit being the Pope just because my health is frail. <laughs> I could imagine a guy hanging on until he dies. I could imagine a guy even committing suicide. Period. Well, I'm 85 years old. I ain't got much time left. Time for me to get out of the way. But I cannot imagine a Pope saying, well, I'll just step aside, let somebody else take the job. It's called retirement. I thought it was come I thought it was something that we all wanted to do. One third of the time. He's retiring. He's retiring. What's wrong with that? Who said something was wrong with it? Who said something was wrong with it? You, you did. You open your mouth. Now say what who said what was wrong with it? You did. Right? No, I did not. What were my words? You look at that video on that video camera. Okay. And you come next week with a clip that says I said something was wrong with it. Okay. Shit on you. Not shit on me. Shit on you. All right. Mike. Now, as I was saying about the Pope, I believe this is an incredibly momentous event. I have no idea what's happening. I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. But I cannot imagine somebody resigning from being pope simply because the guy's in frail health. He said he's going to resign February 28th. Supposedly there'll be a new election for a new pope. It's possible this might take place and be effected toward the end of March. The end of March is again the 77th anniversary of some momentous event that occurred in Europe in, I think, I think we're up to 1936 now. I mentioned this before here. Somebody is observing the 77th anniversary of various horrible events that have occurred in Europe in the mid-1930s. And uh, at the end of March 1936, something very horrible happened. I won't go into it here. But the end of March is the 77th anniversary of another horrible, despicable event that occurred in Europe. And I, I think that maybe this thing with the Pope might have something to do with it. And if nothing else, this whole business about our economy and all this. Uh, Congress is supposed to go through budget deficits or reduction and sequestration and all that, tax this and that, all that baloney, all that's supposed to occur toward the end of March too. I don't know what's happening. But I'm just going to watch and wait and see. Thank you. You come with a video clip next week of me saying I said something was wrong. Good evening, I'm David Rubin, and after this last outburst, I was reconsidering giving any of my own personal thoughts, but I decided to anyhow. Well, Margaret is a very fine speaker, and I am mostly here rebutting the rebuttals and questions <laughs> because they seem so amusing and I don't, I don't know how many conspiracy theories I've heard in the last half hour but um, HIV is, has something to do with, with gays and blacks uh, some sort of conspiracy and of course Mr. Gates and Mrs. Gates have something to do with that you know Man was born around when I was born. Um, and then, then we hear um, drugs intentionally being used for various evil things. Well, I happen to be on several uh, drugs that I, that I take every day, and some enable me to be here and, and appear relatively good to you, in my, in my humble opinion, tonight. Um, and then, then we have... Um, my thought that that many people here would like to solve every issue. Well, so would I. But there are some things that will not be resolved. Whether you're in this political party, that political party, 
this social view, capitalist, socialist, um, whether whether this uh, this particular economic view or that, some things will not be resolved. And so I do uh, just take off my hat um, when I wear it to the um, founding members of these United States in realizing that that not everything will be resolved and and not to expect it to be. Now one one final thought and that is on this matter of plastics. Um, we plastics are great things in many ways. They've resolved numerous issues for us. Uh, but to every to every great thing there might be an opposing thing. Remember that folks although that seems to be forgotten in this group fairly often. And that is, um, plastics are great, but look, if we need more plastics, we, we for, have historically had to re re rely on fossil fuels, although, although that might be changing. So this means um, fossil fuels requires more sources or more, or or more inventions re involving them, and and think of this: the the Gulf of Mexico spill. Well, if 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 we do need more plastics and want to use it, then then don't entirely blame Halliburton or whatever um, company that I personally do like to blame um, for for these. Part of it is that we demand these things, and so cert certain things are required, as in corporations, and, and the end result might be that spills are required. I understand what Margaret had this point in, uh, finally, to, um, that, that we don't know the results of all our technologies, and I do uh, say this, as an engineer, that we do not know what the result of plastics will be in the future, although it did make a good point in a movie a while ago. Thank you. Just one word. Just one word. Where are these guys coming? Yeah. Yeah. He's now, it's true that plastics do make a considerable difference in the issues of state. I'm old enough to remember when kaopectate came in glass bottles, as did Hinkley and Schmidt bottled water. Uh, and, and admittedly, I make as much use of plastics as the next person. But I'm not unmindful of the fact that plastics too often wind up in landfills, but we are just plain running out of space. And so they have not entirely, they've been somewhat a mixed, something of a mixed blessing. Um, with all due respect to the principal speaker of the evening, I agree with the comment that was made earlier that you made a whole bunch of overgeneralizations. Among them, you made some unkind remarks about special education. And I agree that that can be very poorly run. But on, the other hand, on the other hand, as a learning disabled person, I benefited greatly from special education when I was a student 40 years ago at Evanston Township High School. The problem with special ed then was that there wasn't enough of it, and that there should have been more special education teachers, not less. Second, as Tim pointed out, uh, my mother, just like his, taught in the Chicago Public Schools. She taught second grade. My mother was also an active and enthusiastic member of the Chicago Teachers Union, which helped her get the benefits and pay that she needed to support her family and yes, she was divorced and a working mom. Number three, I might say that uh, unions are for blue collar people only, and not for white collar people uh, at all, is nonsense. I'm a card carrying member of the, of the Teamsters Union, which organized the chief judge's office at the Circuit Court of Cook County, where I worked for 30 years before I retired last fall. Number one, the, te the Teamsters Union helped me keep my job uh, despite the efforts of an intrusive and nosy supervisor. 
That's number one. Two, they saw to it that I was able to retire with a full pension. Finally, I have belonged to any number of activities and organizations that might be classified as special interest groups, from groups that are involved with transportation, or protecting civil war sites, protecting the environment, or supporting the state of Israel. And I have heard these activities and those of others all too often called by those who happen to disagree with them as special interest groups. It's become a pejorative term. I would say rather that one person's special interest group is, another, is a heartfelt activity for somebody else. Or to put it another way, it all depends on whose ox is gored, doesn't it? Hello, uh, my name is Andy Anderson. I've been a college regular here for the last, well, probably six years uh, since they went non-smoking. Uh, I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, so uh, uh, inhaling cigarette smoke for me is like being sprayed in the face with mace. Uh, I've been allergic all my life. Uh, I'm totally healthy, except I'm just allergic to tobacco smoke. So I think it's a great thing that we have smoke-free buildings everywhere. It's an idea whose time has come. But uh, some of you here are old enough to remember perhaps 30 years ago you could get into a fist fight if you asked somebody to put out a cigarette uh, smoking next to you at a lunch counter or something. People, would, uh, people were very proud of their ability to say, I have a God-given right to light up and puff away anywhere and there's nothing you can do or say to it and infringe on my civil rights. Well, uh, it takes a while for ideas to move forward to be accepted. Today, all of us are breathing cleaner air. Uh, Dick Gregory once said that a little known uh, fact that never sees the light of day in the news media is that emergency room doctors that are treating kids with asthma attacks. When the kid is brought in, 99% uh, of kids that have breathing problems and asthma attacks come from a family where there's a smoker. Uh, that was like 25 years ago. There's a correlation between uh, smoking and all kinds of illnesses. It's no longer debatable. But in the 50s, when the knowledge that cigarettes were related to uh, various uh, heart disease, lung cancer, when that knowledge became uh, relatively widespread and heading into the general population, the tobacco industry started hiring doctors to go on television and advertise for cigarettes. My doctor smokes Chesterfields, uh, put zest in your life. This is how they create doubt. The proper term for that, what those doctors were involved in, is intellectual prostitution. <laughs> There's the two definitions. If you look it up in the dictionary, there's two definitions of prostitution. One is selling sex. The other is basically selling your soul, uh, being paid to lie to people. Uh, as I said before, uh, an unusual hobby. I, I collect and translate books on blacked out subjects. Like this one here, uh, here's two copies of the censored 2012-2013, Sonoma State University. They, the students and the faculty researchers publish this book every year. They sort through about 500 stories from around the country and they call it down to the top 25 most explosive stories that would change America overnight in a heartbeat. Our country would be different if these stories were covered by the news media rather than intentionally blacked out. Uh, in 1995, for example, the number 16 blacked out story 1995, that's uh, 18 years ago, Sonoma State uh, published a story showing that the clinics around the country, the HIV testing clinics, were cranking out positive results. They figured that 99.9% .9 of all the people that were told they were HIV positive, they weren't. They had no HIV in their blood at all. Uh, the test was uh, simply, uh, they were called false positives. 18 years later, today we know that they're all false positives because the HIV tests come with an insert in the package that says, clinics, doctors, everybody beware, this test does not test for or react to the HIV virus. The lawyers for the companies that make these tests made them put that in the package so that you can't sue them or it's harder to sue them for falsely telling you you're positive. 
and now we talk about the Wall Street banking scam. Well, the insurance companies are currently running a scam on mostly uh, young women that are of marriageable age or are married and uh, thinking about having a child or already pregnant. They're giving away 200,000 free bogus HIV tests to stamp medical records positive for pre-existing conditions so you don't have to provide affordable health care. Um, HIV is considered one of the worst pre-existing conditions you can have stamped on your medical records because it is said to cause all kinds of different illnesses and who knows when. Well, if you know anybody that's got kids or grandkids, you need to get the parents to log on to a site called virusmyth.com and you'll find out what the doctors all over the world have been telling people for the last 20 years. Number one, HIV is a harmless retrovirus. It's not the cause of what was making people sick. Number two, AIDS is not a sexually transmitted infectious disease at all. It's a definition, a new definition of a bunch of old diseases that have been around a long time. Three, the anti-HIV drugs were what was responsible for killing a lot of people. AZT is considered to be rat poison for humans. Uh, the death toll went up. They, they, they killed three, 300,000 young Americans. There's a book that describes this. It's called Wrongful Death the AIDS trial. Um, it describes the intentional poisoning of 30,000, as the earlier fellow mentioned, mostly gay people and minorities were targeted with, they thought they were taking antiviral capsules, but what they were taking was what several doctors have called uh, the equivalent of rat poison for humans. It was fatal. Burroughs Welcome, the English company, was given the contract to put that medicine on the market. They said, we're, we've got a twofer. We're going to kill two birds with one stone because we're going to make billions and billions off of people that are going to think they're stretching out their life with an antiviral treatment, and this is going to be 100% fatal. There will be no survivors. Now, it takes time for this knowledge to spread into the general population if the media is running a coordinated blackout on it. Galileo was uh, arrested and prosecuted for reporting that the earth revolves around the sun. He was arrested, the church didn't want to hear it. People came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. It's what's called the Galileo learning curve. There's another concept we refer to as the Catholic Church Syndrome. If you go into a Catholic church and say, oh, kindly old Father O'Malley here has been molesting your kids for 22 years, half the congregation will say, uh, you're slandering the man. I won't look at the evidence because that can't be true. They just close their minds. The other half says, if a shred of this evidence is true, we have an obligation to try to protect our kids. Well, there's millions of people all over the world in that second group saying, if a shred of this evidence is true, whether it's on the, the, the bogus HIV claims, or whether it's on uh, hydraulic fracturing, whether it's on promotion of nuclear power, there's all kinds of things. Give, give me 30 seconds. Um, the, 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 there's beneficial solutions to all kinds of problems that are being implemented all over the world that are blacked out by the American media. The, and uh, the future is a lot brighter if we look towards solutions for all kinds of things. And you find it is, uh, another gentleman here said, uh, you can do in a day on the internet what would take 15 years in a library. There, before 1998, there was no Google. So uh, you have access to information if you know where to look. Uh, you find something from somebody else, uh, and the knowledge just spreads from person to person. But uh, if we have any kind of future at all, if our grandkids are going to be living on a flat in, on, on an American, on the world where Manhattan and Florida and a bunch of other cities aren't under 20 feet of water, and we have to get our act together now because climate change is real and it's happening. Thank you. About 30 or 40 years ago, I read a book by a very severe critic of public education who allowed that at the turn of the century, when public education was locally funded and locally controlled, it works tolerably well. 
but what uh, the situation had degenerated to was <coughs> all this <coughs> state and federal funding, and all they want to do is just uh, slop at the public trough. <laughs> so I can't. I, I had that author's name a little while ago. I'll see if I can think of it again. Same Something else you might read. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'm not sure. Yeah. What did we read that? The week's events. I'm not too uh, insistent on uh, speaking on the topic. My wife has a. Uh, but my wife edits this thing. James Madison wrote she a edits, memorial and remonstrance against religious from assessments from when he was in the Virginia from legislature. From it was generally considered the basic American document on separation of church and state. And basically what he goes through is all the abuses of state-established religion. And I got to reading that, maybe I got a little too uh, eager with uh, underlying logic, and I could see that that was basically the same thing with public education. <coughs> Madison talked about the arrogant clergy uh, constantly fighting among different sects, basically what we have today. We're not quite as ferocious as it was then. But, you know, what we've heard tonight so far, from the speaker and the rebutters, is just a lot of moralizing, <laughs> which we hear a lot of times anyway around here. But, uh, there's an old Roman saying, Egustibus non disputatum est. There's no disputing values. And he argued, keep, people keep arguing, my values are better than your values. Why don't you just... Uh, well, they are. Yeah, that's what you think. <laughs> no, they're better than yours, Bill. <laughs> if they're so good, why do you have to impose them on everybody? Oh, so, so and again, you know, if you can look that up, that memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments. I think it says a lot <coughs> about what's going on today and what is meant by separation of church and state. And we can apply a lot of that to, uh, you know, it's the problem of people getting paid whether they perform or not. And uh, I think that basically that's what the talk was about tonight. Uh, I don't, I didn't hear anybody say that anybody got fired for these things. This one's a John Stossel was on TV uh, a couple of years ago. He had about a three foot long list Cyber of all the things that New York City schools have to do to fire a teacher. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's one reason we have problems. things done poorly, Margaret asks, because of limited thinking ability, uh, then a moral lack, and if so, which can, what can we do about it? Well, um, oh, no, uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, what we can do about both of these. Since I despair about doing anything uh, myself, that will change the society politically, I don't think that uh, I could do that, or anyone could do that. Uh, thinking skills, these cannot be taught directly, of course. <clears throat> um, nobody knows how to do that. There's no way of doing that directly. It's a horrible noise over there. Are they still going on with your booze? Um, abstractions are very general and, and um, <clears throat> immaterial, whereas 
because reality is really concrete and specific in particular, so ideas don't really work too well in um, the real world. They don't apply. It's very difficult to apply them very hard. That's what we need to do, though. I would recommend a long study of logic, which goes back to the time of Aristotle, 4th century BC, he developed a lot of rules for how to think and um, inductively, scientifically, also deductively, or mathematically, um, and also rules for language, many rules for language and rhetoric, and um, <clears throat> these can be helpful, a lot of fallacies he discovered, and we discovered more, and there's so many fallacies, a fallacy is a mistaken way of thinking, and there's so many of these, nobody has really counted them all. All the different ways in which our thinking can go wrong, there's many of those, and not that many in which they can go right, like, for example, deduction in the categorical syllogism, the old-fashioned um, arguments. Oh, I forget what it is. Socrates is a man, all men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. I'm going to get asked whether those premises are true, and that's a big problem philosophical and scientific problems, many are involved right in that, but, um, but out of those combinations of that, those terms, you get 264 possibilities mathematically, and of those 264 possibilities, only 14 would be valid. The other 240, I think, no, 250, are invalid or wrong or incorrect. And that's a deduction. <laughs> Induction is, goes wrong even more. Uh, because you have the facts of the world to uh, work with. So I, so I recommend that's nevertheless a long study of the many rules of logic as a help to um, improving our thinking. But it has to be a long study. And of course logic is um, would emphasize deduction which is of almost no value practically to practical problem solving whatsoever. And of course we'll probably stress deduction because we probably be taught by somebody mathematically oriented and loves that kind of stuff, but it's, it's, that's not much help. I would concentrate on induction and the rules of uh, language, which are very important to help, you know, clarify our thinking. Um, and, but this course in logic is almost required no, um, no curriculums today, no majors, and it's not a very popular minor whatsoever either because it sounds dry, and it is. There's a bunch of rules you got to memorize. Uh, it's not like the other philosophy courses, which are very speculative. I need to speed along. Uh, Margaret suggested an um, excellent way of proven thinking is disciplined reading. You know, read, and you get ideas, and you get abstractions, uh, concepts, and but you got to work hard to get them. Uh, you got to take notes and study your notes. And that's that's an excellent way of proving your thinking. It's slow. But it's, it's the, the best way we know of. I like, myself, creative thinking. Um, think for yourself. There are books on this, and they're helpful. They're weird that most of creative thinking is wrong. But you get some really good insights out of it. I also recommend imagination to improve our thinking. Imagine different possibilities, different images of things. Good. Now, that can really improve your thinking, and an excellent medium for doing this is the arts. The arts are highly imaginative and creative, often too much so. Um, but they could really improve our thinking skills. But nobody really knows <clears throat> how to awaken curiosity in a person. And um, objectivity, objective thinking, which is what we need in a lot of these political matters. You know, keep people from being selfish and greedy. I have a little bit more to say about that after I finish talking about the current moral lack, <laughs> uh, I don't think there is that big of a moral lack in practice because in practice, yeah, most people, they're not afraid of, they're afraid of getting caught and embarrassed and put in jail and fine. And that's what keeps people moral. If you didn't have that, uh, people would, you know, do whatever they can get away with, which they kind of do now, but they still fear getting caught, you know. I'm sure Jesse and Sandy Jackson thought they wouldn't get caught. <laughs> You know, but I'm curious to see how that comes out, how they, how they did, how they did get revealed. Uh, exposed, I mean, <clears throat> interested in that only, <laughs> not the politics of that war, I care less about that. But, uh, uh, another thing to help moral thinking is to develop deep values, deep values. 
I mean, beyond happiness even, and beyond gender. Uh, uh, but values like justice and equality, fairness, develop your own sense of those. Think a lot about that. you probably come up with something pretty good, not better than most people. Although there's no guarantee. There's Hitler, you know, of course. He is an angry, bitter, horribly person, but um, I don't want to talk about him. We could it's the first time he's been mentioned tonight. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, also, I'd recommend having a sense of personal ethics. Uh, uh, being aware of the ethical dimension. That good is an important part of life, and we're here to do good, and we should try and do good, as much good as we could do with our little lives. But we need to be aware of that, and that, that will help a lot. Act on a sense of duty, duty obligations to others, and to, and to nature, and not just what's mine, give me mine, as Michael Boyko said, was the uh, motto of the city of Chicago, where is mine? Where's my city? Where's my city? Uh, and then, all right, another thing that could help a lot, obviously, is developing a sense of empathy or caring. I'll just read these off. Please. Margaret's Golden Rule, I think, is excellent. Do unto others as you would have them do it to You find that in all religions, all world religions do have that, but you don't need a world religion and can't develop in a very technical way in what he called the uh, categorical imperative. I don't have time to even start on that, but it's just a fancy way of expressing the golden rule. It's just a good guide for uh, ethical thinking and society. And uh, we mostly need to overcome materialism of society, which would lead to uh, unmitigated greed in most people because it's a desire that's very hard to satisfy for material things. Most people don't know how to stop wanting more stuff. Well, I hope these proposals help a little, but we, we um, um, the, uh, life is very complicated, and our emotions need to be subordinate to our thinking. As Plato said, it needs to be a balance with our little faculty of reason, ruling, like in the philosophy of King, but he didn't, he didn't think it would ever happen. Uh, uh, we live in a tragic world. Okay. Very good. Very good. I waited till everybody had a turn. Um, it just to to uh, give a little feedback about the process in the college, and uh, certain things just are getting old, especially since we are talking about uh, thinking. I expect it to be reasonable reason and rational thinking that you meant. Um, We'll take three examples today that were spoken uh, totally in a irrational matter. Uh, the internet, drugs, and plastics. Um, Frank Aguilar would have been here. He prob there would probably be a fist fight over there. Um, he presents that position that Plastic is all evil. We, today we heard that plastic is the panacea of humanity. Drugs, either all toxic, evil, and poison, or, you know, the panacea for women, uh, human health. Uh, internet. Internet, yeah, it has a lot of traps and seduction. But also it gives you all the access to alternative information, which you don't get usually, and to communicate in ways that were not possible before. I agree. Uh, it's one thing I agree with Tim, surprisingly. <laughs> um, but what we are doing here at the college over and over and over again is not using the simple logic the, uh, uh, rules that uh, you were mentioning, Bob, um, uh, induction, deduction. Induction is, uh, uh, those are processes of observations, and the observations have to be scientific and fair. There is a system to how you collect data. And then concluding and seeing what is the probability of lack of of a general principle uh, deriving from it. 
We usually don't do that at all. We rather simplify and take a black or white position to something. And it is never true to reality. Where do you find really black and white? And as a result, it's not useful. Because when we are to take action in life and solve problems, we need to know how to do it without destroying, without throwing the baby with the bath. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of tired from coming to the college anymore, and yet I find myself coming every time. Yeah. Uh, but, guys, think about it. We had a talk about thinking. Before you come here, examine yourself. You don't always have to be right, okay? Because there isn't such a thing. All right, we got a lot of time here. This is cool. All right, education nights, I call these. I guess these always seem to take off at the college. That's what I call them here. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. You guys have given me enough here. Um, let's see, regarding education, um, there's no occupation that doesn't necessitate organized labor or can justify that it should not come under standard labor law. Labor law is not written towards any particular occupation. Any occupation, if you're, there's two ways someone can get fired. And I don't care whether it's a school or a factory or this restaurant or an office, there's two basic ways. And that's conduct and performance. And certainly teachers can be fired. And those teachers are entitled, like anyone who's employed, to due process. And any, there can be no argument that they are not entitled to that. Now the other thing I just want to say, technicality there, you're confusing seniority and a layoff situation here, and you're kind of mixing up. Seniority doesn't cross occupations and things like that. But that's just a minor thing. I, you were way off the mark on that. Uh, there's the thing, reduction in force, they call it. And it has nothing to do generally with occupation specific. Though there are, you have to watch out for picking and choosing in those situations. That's exactly what they do. They try to lay off people in, and bypass uh, this other disciplinary actions. Uh, but in no occupant, labor laws apply to everyone who's employed. And to say that they're not entitled to the jurisdiction of labor law, I think is going to be a difficult argument for you to present. They are not, it is not an occupation that is subject to mistreatment. And they are entitled to the same dignity in the workplace as anyone else who works for a living. Um, the other thing about, you probably can make an argument that teachers need the structure that a union contract brings because it is highly political situation. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? If Johnny can't read, guess whose fault it is? Now I'm going to give you an example. The college teacher said, oh, what's going on here? These college students aren't any good. I've told this story. What, what are they doing in high school? The high school teacher said, boy, these kids are really stupid. They're not teaching them anything in elementary school. And the elementary school teacher said, boy, these kids are really stupid. What's with the parents? And then the mother says, well, what's wrong with the father? Our kids are really stupid. <laughs> so you got to go around pointing blame and it's no easy on special education teachers. I spent a year substituting, as a matter of fact, special education classes, and that's a very difficult situation. And I think they're committed people and they have the best interests of the students. You know, now let's jump to CTA here. 
And, you know, I shouldn't talk because you're talking about bus stop. I have my own bus stop at 32nd and Alston. But you got me to thinking, Margaret, maybe I should get it heated as well. And I'm not making that up when I say it in my own bus stop here. But you seem to read, you mentioned there that CTA drivers are so discourteous, and don't do this and don't do that. And every time I leave the college, if Tim doesn't drive me, I take the number eight bus home. And I'm not kidding you. Do you know who gets on buses this time of night? You got low-life crazies and idiots. <laughs> and invariably there is someone who feels they don't have to pay transit fare for some reason. <laughs> Do you know who gets on a public transit bus? I mean, that's why they have shields. They have plastic shields. By the way, you know, the plastic. I mean, do right, you have any idea what kind of occupation this entails? And then to say, well, now for every example, there's a counterexample. Uh, now, special interest group, I'm sorry. I think you've got to change your terminology. It's not special interest groups. It's the money in the political process which the Supreme Court has ruled is okay. Being good citizens and joining associations and advancing social issues, that's the process. That's what we should encourage. That's why the College of Compliments exists, just to be a spokesperson for these situations that need correction and to speak about them. No. I spent, thank the Lord for, I'm not, whoops. Well, I mean, here, well, now. All right, thank you. Uh, what is void. it? Like, well, void. Yeah, thank the void for special interest groups. That's what makes our society function and improvement and brings about um, those change that we sometimes call progress. So without it, there'd be total stagnation. Uh, the other thing, the trend is family-friendly workplace. We have to recognize the demographics of the workforce has changed. And I'm going to tell you one thing about this thing about family for that you may not realize. If I'm a single parent and I have to get out of work for anything like that, Charlie gets all the time he wants. I get it. They'll give, oh, poor Charlie. He's got to raise those kids or two by himself. Now, if I was a woman, I would be disciplined, and I assure you that happens all the time. And that's why we need that. I mean, there are people who are trying to be good citizens and parents at the same time. So I was thinking, I was going to think, I, next time a woman comes in in trouble for missing work, I'm going to tell her, well, why do you have kids? <laughs> <laughs> Will you have me report it to the union? <laughs> uh, no, listen, let's see here. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Andy, 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 please. 15 years, one day on the internet is equal to 15 years in the library? What? It's just the opposite. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing on the internet. YouTube gibberish is information. That's nonsense. You just That's haven't looked deep enough, Charlie. Wait a minute, now we got time. I gotta go after this guy and his plastic. <laughs> now, plastic, I will admit, replaced metal and cast iron. But even at work, when I see people with one of these, I always tell them, I say, if you're done with your beverage, why don't you take it and put it in a landfill? And guess what? About a million years from now, you can go back there and this thing's still going to be there. <laughs> and you can use it. Now, in my office in Washington, I go photograph the trains across the street and the block away. And there's something that I, that's very unusual. You don't see it too much here. But there is train after train of compressed, disposed waste garbage in container trains of garbage. This is what we've got. Now, this is a petroleum byproduct, and they've hit on it. You think that thing BP did with their oil well is the benefit of capitalism, what, destroying the Gulf of Mexico? <laughs> is, and then there's, what isn't there? Isn't there an island in the Pacific that's as big as Greenland that's all, like, 
water bottles <laughs> and that stuff that six packs that go in and jump the birds and stuff. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was thinking about it. it. Used to be we had Gillette razors, you know, with blue blades, metal ones. Now I got these shitty big things. Which I, what do they work? About one shave, and you throw it away. I don't know if that's progress. I, I think, it, but no, you have to think about the energy that goes in. And that's why they call it a carbon footprint and the energy that goes out. And I don't think plastics are quite there yet. You know, certainly superior to metals. And I think that's about it. All right. Thank you again. That was good. I will be very brief. Speak into the microphone. Margaret has had some frustrations dealing with uh, teachers and administrations of uh, public schools. Uh, she might equally have had uh, frustrations dealing with private schools. Uh, <laughs> but uh, public, private, uh, regardless of whether the uh, the society calls itself capitalist or socialist or uh, <laughs> progressive or regressive or whatever. I'm afraid that making generalizations about the, the social relations might wind up in, uh, you got this. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have frustrations. Uh, educating a child with problems uh, is difficult. Darn difficult. Uh, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, uh, or a parent. And uh, the uh, Social relations of uh, schools uh, have all sorts of problems, and they uh, do relate to the general form of the society. Uh, but uh, there, uh, what little uh, achievement one may make in altering a, a, a problem oh, yeah. in one school or uh, should not necessarily be projected to the whole of the society. Yeah. You brought up the H word. I just have one word. Uh, one word. Where's the Korean? Thorium. <laughs> oh. uh, I particularly enjoyed what uh, David Zucker said uh, this evening. Uh, I thought he, he was rather eloquent. However, uh, when he said uh, that um, uh, about plastics and mentioned the problem with the landfills and saying we're running out of space, uh, this is not the fault of the plastic industry, this is the fault of the recyclers and people who are not reprocessing these things. As I had said earlier, they, the, the good thing about plastics is that when they're used, when, when their use is no longer needed, they can be melted down and reused. So I think that when David Zucker uh, uh, use the uh, thing about landfills and that we're running out of room, I, I, I think he's just hiding behind his beard. Well, I go with what Frank Aguilar always said. Plastic. Plastics. They, anybody has bought a quart of soda. Three kinds of plastic. 
You can't recycle that. That's what capitalism, they don't care. They don't care about recycling. The cap, the bottom, and the middle. Three different kinds. No recycling. Okay, Margaret, can you give a shit? Pull the microphone down. Oh, uh, I'll get you some lights. Can I have everybody's attention, please? Just for tonight, can I ask everybody to please leave out the front door? I'm very sorry about the inconvenience. It's just for tonight. We, we normally will not have double shows on Saturday, but they're in the process. They're right in the middle of our comedy show. So if I could just get you to walk out the front door, and then you just make a direct right, and the parking lot is right there. We love you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for putting up with us. I appreciate it. Really do. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I need the microphone. Okay, can I have everybody's attention again? I like this microphone. Well, I wish I had one of these at home. No, I got some very exciting news. We're going to be on the news Monday morning at 7 a.m. Channel 9. The whole crew will be here dressed up for Presidential Day. So please, if you're in the area, or just watch us, talk about us. Right, not tomorrow, but the next day. Monday morning, 7 a.m., Channel 9. Everybody from Channel 9 will be here all dressed up and we're going to be filming it live here so if you you know if you're if well, i know what's you're the reason? Where are they going to be well, presidential day restaurant. channel nine because we're the lincoln restaurant right oh. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. so please please if you're in the area please stop by if not please watch us or talk about us tell somebody tell your neighbor tell your mother yeah I'm gonna tell, tell your I'm sister four presidents four presidents Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Hey, can I have one of these? <laughs> can I have this? Can I take tape? this home? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mark. Thank what you, everybody. Thank you. Is everything okay? Can you read there with, it, with everything? Okay. Oh. Uh, I have to read this for you. All right. Uh, okay. Is this on? Yes, yes. it is. Okay. Uh, uh, the idea of reducing the work week uh, to create more jobs. Not a bad idea. I think they tried that in France, but the problem is uh, that employers are not going to pay accordingly. Um, as they cut down out so many jobs and vastly increased uh, productivity accordingly, they have not even increased the pay for the remaining workers who are working so much harder. So you know how stingy employers can be. And the big thing is making profits and profits and profits and paying, you know, the CEO $9 million dollars and all that. All right, education. Uh, it's, um, I think it was that there should be more um, challenges uh, by teachers. I guess that was the idea of making students think. And um, uh, let's see what else. Read my notes here. Um, that there's too much uh, um Competition and not enough cooperation in the world, I agree with that. Uh, that uh, maybe people's thinking has gotten mixed up because of propaganda, which, yeah, I mean, you, you can be fooled, but the, pro the point is to analyze the things that you hear. And of course, and I didn't mention this before, but when you read, you want to get impartial sources of information. You don't want to go to sources that, I mean, are excellent, excellent. And this relates to a, a point further on, as though today's media doesn't tell us the truth. It does. Anybody that has read the New York Times, The Economist magazine, for example, knows that there are all kinds of scandals that are brought out by those publications. I mean, actually, and I could give you, if there were time, a list, in fact, a lot of my information is from the New York Times weekend edition. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one, uh, let's see, uh, solution for all the, uh, is it the cr uh, criticism of that uh, uh, trying to one solution for all issues? Uh, no, I mean, this isn't really uh, the fact that people, the world is screwed up by selfishness. 
I mean, getting rid of selfishness, I mean, it's not going to solve everything like the global warming, which is already taking place, but it will solve many uh, things. Um, should not, uh, let's see. Uh, not, uh, oh, that, that traditional values should be challenged? Yes and no. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, if, if, um, if your um, values really help society and they're traditional, you shouldn't be throwing them out. Um, real, um, uh, the people, uh, some pointed out that uh, the um, bright people are kind of brought off by the rich people. Yes. And, uh, and uh, that may be why we these bright people aren't as available as they should be to solve our problems. Um, work for um, uh, the plastic thing. Here is Charlie and I agree for once. Uh, I do agree. I even have a. Ch I probably isn't time to read this, but a chapter in my this book about how we got into plastics and other synthetic materials after World War II. No one took a vote on it. It's ended up in all these landfills, toxic landfills and stuff. And yeah, I can't really read it now too much, uh, but it's uh, true that uh, we do have the toxic dumps, and we do have a throwaway society. And we, of course, instead of at work, having your uh, <coughs> own uh, China cup to use every day, you know, you have the uh, styrofoam ones which you use once and throw away. So it is, I, I agree that plastics are certainly not any, I don't know why that man brought the subject up, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, you're still here. All right, well, I mean, I don't even know why it came up, but anyway. Uh, and, um, okay, where are we here? Oh, yeah, that living together, uh, two parents. Um, okay, a man and a woman living together as a parent is not a bad idea. Actually, it is a bad idea. Marriage is still preferable. It's much more um, lasting than the um, living in arrangement. There are statistics that show us that the living in uh, cohabiting, as they call it, doesn't last long, so the kid is, you know, three or four years later, doesn't have a father and so forth. Um, and uh, capitalism works for, uh, Tim said this, capitalism works for the common man. Yeah, I would say it does as long as it is properly um, regulated by the government. I missed the talk. You can't let the big banks run all over everybody. You can't do that type of thing. Or you have to have the government regulating the, the environment. Certainly the big business is not going to regulate, be careful about what they do to the environment unless they're forced to. Um, the Facebook, now this I can't agree with, it's like your old time socializing? No. It's, it's, it's not at all, at all. I mean, old time socializing is face to face. You see the person. It's not a substitute. It's known not to be a substitute. There's well, a lot I agree. Of criticism. I agree, but it certainly helps in getting helps people problems. together. Ah. Oh, you call that getting together? Uh, I think it's, it's actually made people less social. And I've heard that when people go to Facebook is because that way they don't have to show their underside. I mean, you can just see the good things, you know, in their life. And nobody finds out about the bad things. It's kind of hiding behind. You're not, it's not the real world. I don't think. Anyway, um, and they don't, um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm trying to slide in my notes. Oh, we don't, there need to be, uh, not everything can be resolved. And it's probably true, but I think we should make an honest effort. Um, plastics and can't skills, okay, study. Um, there are many fallacies in our thinking. Yeah, um, we need more. We need to be more objective. This is true. This is very true. That would help everybody's thinking ability. And I mean, you have to be like, get the facts first and then make up your mind. Don't go to an issue with your mind already made up. Uh, fear keeps people uh, more. Uh, it keeps you more from the point of view of not doing anything to extreme like killing and stealing. But the more minor things are, um, there's no fear in there. There's no even uh, religions, maybe in the old days they did, but 
and it's not working. Developing values like fairness, or Bob said this, that's a good value, that's an important value. Fairness, Justice. trying to be a good person, doing your duty, having a duty, uh, and caring, and overcoming um, materialism, and unmitigated greed. And I would add to that things, having to accumulate more and more things. Uh, I can get, it says, um, it says, try to see, emotions, emotions should be uh, subordinate uh, to thinking, yes. That you, everyone would have better thinking if there was less emotion in it. Yeah, yeah but few can do that. Excuse me? Only a few people can do that. Yeah, well, they should work at it. And teachers can, teachers can be fired. Um, and um, a seniority, and, and Charlie totally misunderstood what I was saying about seniority. I'm not talking about um, seniority in a blue collar occupation. I'm talking about in a, these are cases, actual cases that happen where the math teacher has less seniority, is let go, and they have to cut teaching staff, and there's not a math teacher left, and therefore the English teacher or somebody else has to teach math. And works. no wonder kids don't know math, which is always exactly the way it works. Yes. Anywhere. I know for a fact. I'm All right, I have chapter and verse. I've I can give you references. Fifty hundred. I can give you references. I can give you references. I can Evidence. Uh, what the source, source, well, what do you think I do with a living? Sources. All right, Charles. Years ago. All right. All right. That's, that's First, they have to cover the curriculum. So, so, Margaret, close us out. Each kid. That's all right. We'll take care of it. Thirty per month. Wow. Uh, uh, we'll show fifty in and get rid of that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thirty per class. Wow. 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 Wow.